looking at Barun and how the whole question of property rights was brought about, only showed and also became very inspiring to me that there's an alternative way of thinking. It's not that these problems are being sorted out. There are problems, but they're a way of looking at it and the issues that have to be handled. And this is an important point, because when you look at just property rights, property rights, there's also the question of if whether you have to look at common property rights. And environmentalists have raised this considerably, but if you have common property rights, then the whole system of a market and private property rights, how do you handle that? But since that is on property rights and we have to do an intellectual property rights, there's a similar problem that comes up in intellectual property rights which my ISI friend will tell you, she must have debated over with Arrow's theorem, because the whole concept that came up is that the features of intellectual property rights, simply the fact that it is non-rival and it's non-excludable, makes it a public good. If it is a public good, of course it's commercialized because an incentive has to be created for people to make it profitable. But Arrow argued that if it's a public good, it should be given free. Am I right, if yes. I remember my economics? And therefore, uh, how does one handle this? And if it is a private good and it also creates a certain amount of dominance, it comes to the Competition Commission. And when it comes to the Competition Commission and then we have to look at it, then there is always a tension that continues to prevail. And some of these tensions that are, many of them have been resolved. A lot of the tensions have been resolved between patent rights and property rights and how to handle it. But I think the one tension which perhaps you could uh, look at it is the way patents have expanded. You see, they've expanded from patent rights to copyright acts to creative design. And in that, the problem more is in the question of um, whose idea is it. That's, uh, you know, th that's where it really pinches of finding out. And if someone has an idea, you know, if I'm able to design a car in this manner and I take a copyright in the US, does it hold in India too? And then there are a whole set of implications that come about it. Another very interesting expansion that has taken place, because these are the sort of cases that come to the commission. And as an antitrust person, that's how I would have to start investigating, is this aspect that now you have what are known as NPAs these are portfolio asset companies which take and buy up all the patents and put them together in a troll. And you, uh, and a person who is buying this, which we have one or two cases in the commission, would be paying the patent fee for so many different elements of it. Now the expansion of one and the other one is the combining into a portfolio are cases which have come up before the commission because they don't deal with simple things like excess pricing, but also on the question of if you're not able to identify whose idea it is, if you're not able to get the patent as due, are consumers being taken for a ride? Let me stop here. So friends, let's hear Baskar on whose idea it is. There's a shift as well. Not, uh, I would not say at the very basic fundamental level but there is a shift when we talk about property and then we go to intellectual property. And I think that uh, things could not have been introduced in a better way than what Dr. Gori has done, just done. And uh, even for the organizers to start this session with this uh, seemingly philosophical topic of uh, whose idea is this. What I would try to do is that uh, we try to just put things on the plate before you about intellectual property rights with this question that whose idea is this with the, with the context of what Dr. Gauri rightly said as common property rights versus property rights of, a, of an entity. And for this, uh, the examples that I uh, would possibly draw from is from, I think, the, one of the most contested and most uh, controversial for that matter to say fields when we talk about patents, that is pharmaceutical patents, where there is a constant debate between who is the actual beneficiary of, in, of innovation and who should be the actual beneficiary of innovation. So uh, asking myself the same question again, if we look at the case of pharmaceutical patents for, an, for, for the purposes of an example, and we ask ourselves this question that who owns an idea? or whose idea is it. So we are talking about here 
slightly different kind of a property we are talking about IP that means we are talking about an intangible property now if we say that who is the owner of that intangible property is the owner who is the proprietor of a particular exclusive rights in the form of patents whether he or she is the owner or is the owner the ultimate user of that idea putting this perspective into a pharmaceutical field say it is a pharmaceutical company done some R&D got a patent on a particular innovative drug whether that pharmaceutical company has rightful entitlement towards enjoying that property in the form of a patent or it is the ultimate object or the consumer of that drug say for a particular disease for which there was no drug available earlier whether that person or you can say collective rights of all the patients of that particular disease they are the right foot they have the right foot entitlement towards that property and if you look at these two extremes we would see that this entire debate with respect to pharmaceutical patents with respect to pharmaceutical R&D with respect to the topic of patents and healthcare access actually stems from these two extremes it is basically a conflict between these two ideas or these two you can say catchment areas that gives rise to the entire debate on pharmaceutical patents vis-a-vis -vis healthcare access I think this is true for the entire world but in India it is absolutely apparent given our socio-economic conditions and also given the fact that India is quite advanced and trying to advance technologically as well to go further I would really not like to draw a conclusion because frankly I don't even have a conclusion to the question of whose idea is it but let us put this thing in perspective as to if we want to get to a conclusion or if we want to reach to a kind of a solution here this all will depend on the perspective that we take the perspective of intellectual property itself now whenever we talk about intellectual property the first thing that I have seen people say I have seen people believe I have seen it I mean everywhere if when you go when you talk about intellectual property somehow the concept starts from the concept of a monopoly people who don't know Hindi Ekaswa literally or transliterated would mean monopoly so there somehow it shows that the concept itself at least is not balanced when, 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 you, when you translate or when you adopt or when you invent a particular word to describe a patent you actually use the word monopoly it may be interesting many of you uh, would be knowing it but actually if you look into the history of patent laws patents law has actually originated for laws of disclosure and not law of monopoly in fact patents were invented at some point of time to to basically uh, disapprove or to kind of discourage monopoly to discourage something which was even today existent as trade secrets because and sometimes again there is a myth we should understand which we always say and since we are speaking in India to say that this is something a concept the monopoly concept or the trade monopoly concept has come somewhere from the West and this is not completely in alignment with the civilization that we have I think again we are a little bit misplaced in your thoughts because we go back to history and what history even if we go back to mythology we can have several examples where monopolies were very outrightly created and if you do not go to the mythology I don't want to tell you the story of a Dronacharya and Aiklavya there's a story of I mean how a particular teacher had the right hand thumb of one of his uh, of another uh, uh, of an archer cut so that his student would be the best archer around at that point of time but that is mythology it, it is a historical fact also that India used to export this uh, mango variety called Malda it is from West Bengal very tasty variety during the British Raj and all the Malda cultivators there was a practice that each mango before being packed was pierced with a needle and then they used to 
ship it. The reason was they did not want anybody to use the seeds and grow the Malda mango and have the taste of that mango again. So, so concept of monopoly is very deep rooted in trade. Now, if you look again, coming back to the thing that when we, dis when we talk about this question of to whom does the idea belong, we need to see with what perspective are we looking at patents. Are we looking at patents with the perspective of a monopoly or are we looking at patents or IP with a perspective of disclosure? If you take either of the perspectives, if you take any of the perspective, you will see that the entire, there's a paradigm shift in how you assess the question of who the entire uh, idea or a IP or a tangible, non intangible asset belongs to. To go further into this, if we take, for example, the perspective of monopoly, that IP is something which is a monopoly. Then the next question to be asked is that does IP restrict innovation? If you look at the other perspective that IP is something which is about disclosure, then the next question is does IP open new avenues for innovation? And I will, I think, try to conclude just by giving an example from both these perspectives. I'll take the second perspective first. That is the question that does IP or creation of IP restrict innovation? Now we have known that in recent future, recent past, and recent past we are just saying that say for example past three decades if we take, and we look into the healthcare sector, we look into the kind of new technologies, new drugs or new therapies which have come up, we would see that in the past three decades the death rates have reduced drastically in several disease areas. Now, uh, to give you some examples, ischemic heart disease, it is around 41% decrease. Hypertensive heart disease, 61% decrease. Early infancy diseases, around 81% de uh, de decrease. Atherosclerosis, around 68% decrease. Now, this decrease might have been caused. Obviously, medical technologies is advancing, but one of the predominant reason for this decreases would also be newer therapeutics have come into the market. There are drugs which are available now for unmet medical needs which are not there in the past. To give you certain examples from that, if you look at 2006, it was the first vaccine for prevention of cervical cancer. So this is something new that come, came for a disease which was existing, but the remedy was not. 2007, there was a new class of medicine to treat hypertensions. 2008, the new treatment for Crohn's disease. Then 2009, the first, treat, first treatment for peripheral T-cell lymphoma. And there are other examples as well. 2013, there were two new drugs to treat uh, skin cancer. So if you look at all these innovations, these innovations required certain incentives. It is true and it is nobody's case that innovations may or may not be accessible. Innovations have to be accessible because when we are talking about treatment of particular diseases, we mean diseases of living human beings. So if there is an innovative drug, that innovative drug needs to reach that living human being. However, if I now go to my first option about the restrictive aspects of IP and I try to find a solution to that, and why I said that I do not have a solution is that if you want to have or if you want to discuss or come to any kind of a policy or policy approach towards this, it is actually egg chicken egg kind of a situation. Because the question is that if there are no new drugs, then diseases cannot be treated. But if there are new drugs, which is not accessible to a patient who is suffering from the disease, again the question or the situation remains the same that the disease cannot be treated. Taking the same question in a different way that if the drugs are not accessible to the patient it is as good as a situation that there is no drug at all. However, if there is no drug at all then there is no question of access to the patient as well. And that is why this entire question 
is a egg chicken egg kind of a policy it requires the, the approach is something like that of a egg chicken egg so lastly uh, what i wanted to uh, just cover was that if you look at that second up uh, the the first approach where when where we say that does ip restrict or does ip restrict uh, access to innovation here we uh, i can it's my personal opinion that if you if you look at this first aspect about whether ip is restrictive or not and i ask the first question that we asked ourselves that whose idea is it and try, try to find maybe a kind of a path towards a solution then obviously we cannot say that an idea belongs solely or exclusively or in a monopolistic term to the person who has generated and kind of protected that idea in this case the patent holder for that the idea has to be for some object so even if i look at it in a completely commercial term if i am a company i have a patent i have I've, i have a new drug i have got a patent it makes no sense for me if i do not have a market to sell that drug or if i do not have a patient who would consume that drug so without this collective rights towards an innovation my individual rights of ip makes no sense so that is why if i may in my very humble attempt try to answer this question that whose idea is it the idea belongs to the larger collective environment i as an individual have been giving a time bound exclusivity of sort so that i get the incentive to innovate more that is the only way that i can perhaps try to answer this question thank you i'm largely going to lean into one of the studies that um uh, my co-author amir and i did at some point uh the the context where we were coming from is exactly how is intellectual property and innovation a chicken and egg story what drives what and and what are the drivers of all this innovation that happen and when we started to look at at um, iprs and innovation and how this causality works the first thing was to go back and look at the context so intellectual property as a concept has existed for more than 100 years now it started off with the bern convention trying to protect uh, give protection to literary and artistic works and then this was revised and it came up in various uh, shapes and forms all the way up to the universal copyright convention where india is also a member trying but essentially it was to try and protect the 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 knowledge of the person and award the knowledge of the person who cr created the 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 property in that in some sense in the literary space and then also enabled the translation and reproduction and spread without it being uh, without it being diluted in that sense and india sort of followed this this similar sort of trend we've had the dramatic performances act back in 1876 and we've gone on and had various uh, sort of versions of the way we have protected intellectual property and what creation of intellectual property but going back to uh, ms gauri um the final version that rests today and the way we look at intellectual property today in the trade and trade related perspective is what trips put uh, put in place uh, where we split up intellectual property into seven buckets patents copyrights trademarks geographical indications etc etc and again at this point we started to think about is there an option to intellectual property right uh the idea is fair that we do not want to make any idea uh, any concept or new idea or innovation exclusive in its sense we don't want to create these monopolies and exclude people from new developments and innovation and yet we want to award the culture of innovation we want to create an award system where there is a return on the kind of investments that people make on research on and a lot of these investments and uh, you'll agree that whether in pharma or in telecom or in technology or just in case of even software etc 
there's a lot of thinking that goes in there's a lot of people time and monetary investments that go into creating this intellectual property and therefore what is the incentive to uh, to innovate and it, and is intellectual prop is there an option to intellectual properties as that incentive to innovate um so that's where we were looking uh, we came in and we looked at also the history of what what literature says in terms of intellectual property uh, uh is to innovation what 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 does intellectual property do, do and the way economic literature talks about this is largely to look at a north south divide right so the it's it's almost like the haves and the have nots right so in in intellectual property largely seems to congregate in hubs if we see the top 10 countries if we see the top 10 countries that 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 uh, uh, that the top 10 countries in terms of number of paste patents filed for instance they account for more than 75 to 80% in any given year of all the patents filed which which just shows that innovation sort of congregates in hubs and even if you look at it in terms of just you know uh, the more popular examples e- even within the us which is considered one of the leading innovators in the world it's that hub of bay area right uh, where it was edison versus tesla it was it is uh, bill gates versus uh, steve jobs it's that one geographical area where everything convenes right even back home if you look at it eight centers in india can account for pretty much all the innovation that happens right so what we started to look at was this north south divide developed econ- uh, at a global level developed economies vibrant economies uh, which also become the source of technology and innovation and therefore these are the people who are demanding more ipr to ensure you know to to keep their competitive ent- advantage right and they're on this positive spiral of innovation and and growth right they they're sort of keeping a competitive advantage on the other hand what's the option for the south for instance these are emerging de- uh, uh, economies their options to growth they don't ha- in largely do not have the kind of infrastructure and it etc so their options to growth is either by technology transfers which is expensive because of the intellectual property and their uh, and either that or imitation and if we see a lot of the growth that has happened for china etc has been initial the initial spurt came from largely in imitation right and then they have gotten into the whole innovation space but these are places where ipr is more about protection of the nascent uh, stages of the economy rather than about competitive advantage right so that's that's the way we uh, you know um, my perspective our perspective on the whole what is the role of intellectual property in terms of uh, innovation was but then we said let's go one step further uh, we said you know in god we trust all else must bring data so let's look at data and uh, ask ourselves the question what is the ro- what is this role what is the causality what way does the causality work does intellectual property rights drive innovation or is it the other way around and what are the other factors that drive this environment can we find some sort of patterns in data and therefore we said fine let's fix a metric so what what is the metric for innovation let's for us we said let's look at the number of patents filed right or granted that's fine but let's look at the number of patents filed because that's more about how many people think they're innovating and they're they're coming up with new ideas that are worth being deemed innovation and therefore um the level of innovation will be fixed by that and then let's start to collate the various metrics that we think in the envi- are measures in the environment of of wealth of investment of r&d spends of environment what else can we look at so we started on this data collation we we went to the um, world intellectual property uh, organization wipo database a uh, beautiful database that has uh, a 
data across 133 countries, 123 years of data about how, mu how many patents were filed, etc. And then we also started to map it against macroeconomic variables, IT infrastructure variables, policy metrics, uh, all the ease of doing business sort of metrics, and started to look at just just let's start look at causality. Let's see which way the the lags work, etc. So the first thing that came through to us, which was very interesting, this is just a dispersion of the number of patents, top ten countries in terms of uh, patents filed. And for us, it was a, a moment of a new world order, right? Uh, where earlier a, the Asian economies were a really and and not too far back, 1980s most innovation being focused around the western economies not so much in asia to the asian superpowers uh, so to say in terms of china korea um, going from one to eight percent nine at one point and even india is not doing so badly so um but china was the huge huge jump so what the, these kind of trends started to get us to think is it is it really the size of the economy is it gdp growth is it the overall GDP? Is it what is it in the environment that's taking China from a zero to a 35, right? And being a leading innovator globally, and therefore we started to uh, started to uh, cross plot and see data um, like this. So uh, again, across those countries, across a, a period of time, and let's see whether there's correlations in terms of patents and GDP growth percentages. Uh, patents and foreign direct investment level of you know a measure of how open the economy is etc and we couldn't see any major patterns uh, FDI uh, slightly but really no major pattern when we start to look at the numbers ha um, in terms of innovation and uh, per capita uh, incomes right uh, in terms of is, is 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 there a certain threshold of wealth that we need to hit you know, it's it's like it's it's a, almost a parallel of uh, Maslow's hierarchy, right? You 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 need to get to that self actualization to be <laughs> to be innovating. So um, that's where we started to think: is there a correlation between maybe innovation and GD, uh, per capita uh, incomes, per capita GDP? And it there seems to be something emerging here, though. Again, when we cro uh, when we uh, tab it versus what we know about the whole north south thing, is it we don't know which way the causality works, right? Is it that incomes are higher because you have a competitive advantage and you're able to get uh, a, you know uh, earn higher incomes, or uh, or is it because now we've re reached self actualization and therefore we have to we are not bothered about fighting for our daily bread and we are able to innovate? So. We weren't quite clear about which way that causality works, in, in at least from the data. But then one thing that absolutely came through to us was legacy. You know, innovation is a self-sustaining habit, right? So if you look at trends, once we once an economy hits that positive spiral, it just keeps going. So there are very there there would be hardly any economies in that 133 countries that would have dropped out of the innovation race they are now not contributing to as many patents because there are new emerging economies but they're still sustaining a basic level of innovation so innovation is a culture innovation is a self sustaining cycle and that's that's something that completely came through so which is why when we when we started to sum it up these were our big pointers it's not about growth it's it's not about a grow, growing economy yes there's something to income but it's largely the environment it's it's the innovation environment that's not there in these rather uh, uh, top level macroeconomic uh, factors but it's more about infrastructure it's more about policy it's more about how the the whole regulatory environment supports innovation in that sense and the, um, so when we started to do this we said okay fine it's maybe works at a global level let's look at it in terms of india uh, so again we went back and we looked at the controller general of patents and we looked at this data and uh, 
at a center level what are the kind of uh, patent uh, uh, applications and we get very similar uh, and when we start to look at state uh, gdps and and uh, such factors we get very similar results to what we saw in the global um, global database and then that and basis that what we were able to see was that india is now in some sense starting to hit that positive spiral of innovation right we have had our scores improve we are not in the league of china uh, there is an increased ipr protection it's still not so for instance large parts of businesses in corporate india are still not as appreciative of what intellectual property rights are and yet there is some sense because it's about competition and gaining a competitive advantage there is some basic nascent awareness that's coming through which also reflects in the kind of r and d spending that we are seeing right in in the in in some way in some sense r and d spending is all about investing to innovation and up, an appreciation of innovation the copyright uh, software protection that we have seen is not where Uh, a a bunch of us practitioners will want it to be but it's a start right in some sense it's an appreciation of the the kind of uh, knowledge uh, property that uh, software is and then the make in india yes it's it was launched with huge fanfare but it also brought in the whole aspect of intellectual property rights being a very very important uh, factor in driving innovation and therefore growth um and while we we're all gung ho about how india is is getting there there's lots to do in terms of intellectual property so again while the software uh, cop, uh the software protection under copyrights is is a step in the positive direction there's there's leaps to go um all, uh, and also from the fact that the implementation of a lot of these uh laws is poor resolution takes forever uh because it all has to go through the judicial uh, system and therefore somewhere the whole practitioners the whole business angle of it um becomes very very nonchalant to a lot of these uh these policies and they become sort of theoretical policies rather than getting adopted in the entire environment and finally patenting is hugely complicated for practitioners and business people who uh, who are trying to create that competitive advantage um it's not just novelty it's not just usefulness in india patenting is an inventive step it has to be capable of in industrial application so there's almost like a like an incumbent barrier that uh, a lot of innovators have created uh, at least in india which we feel is something that in the environment is something that we uh, we want to um, we want to work around uh, as we try and create intellectual uh, an intellectual property right regime that fosters innovation and we're trying to emulate uh, we 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 try and work around these to be able to take us further on that positive spiral that um, that china seems to have hit so that's that's this kind of uh, of perspective we had in uh, as as a team to what intellectual property rights do to innovation and therefore economic growth first issue uh, is that to get market functioning you have to have very clear property rights i mean that's the incentive on which it functions but unfortunately the market functioning that comes to the commission the competition commission when i say commission are all competitors they all want to use the commission to get an edge by getting a case you see so it's 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 a very gray area of trying to find out while it could be a chicken and an egg and there are ways in the act that you can always find in talks of abuse of dominance because basically the patent does give a legal right to a dominant position but the point is that the act itself is so structuralist that unfortunately lawyers can argue both ways because the basic point is if you look at it structuralist any person with a patent could be dominant but given the fact that he can charge a high price 
also means there will be a lot of people who want to jump in. So we, the commission has to keep looking at competitive constraints. It is not dominance in terms of a traditional market share or looking at he's a dominant enterprise or he has got so much of a market share. It's just try and see what are the competitive constraints that come in. And the maximum consta uh, competitive constraints really come from demand. That is from the side of the consumer. If there is very highly elastic demand, however much a monopolist may want to keep his price high, it's going to flop. He has to work out to meet this demand. And this we find in drugs. This is also what we find in things like seeds, genetically modified seeds. This is what you find even in things like software. So the question is that the consumer then starts becoming very important because he gives the counter pressure. He's that competitive constraint. But never has there been a definition of who is the consumer. Now, when it comes up to this question involved, and we are trying to, uh, we, I mean, as a commission, looks at it, and you look at a monopolist, and you try to look at it in terms of dominance that is appearing, there are lots of cases because the consumer who comes to the commission is a competitor. None of us go. I, I remember right in the beginning, there was someone who came from Harvard University and gave a long lecture on how Microsoft was a monopolist because of his word. I, I for no reason could understand why I should fight against word and be an ISI student and go into R and open access. I mean, that's their business to code. My business is to just get my little bit of linear regressions and finish off with it. And if Microsoft could give me that benefit, why should I bother whether it's a monopolist? And Microsoft, let me tell you, is always on an edge because they kept getting shifted out. Similarly, the argument that's come up, and I've just finished a paper on Google, that who are we protecting? Are we protecting competition or are we protecting competitors? Because if you have to remain at the top, the, the collapse is as quick as to remain at the top. So they're continuously running to stay where they are. There are other issues, of course. There are issues of income distribution. There's issues of income inequality that comes up. Now, if that is going to be the case, a commission which starts looking at a monopolist, starts looking at who is the consumer, the problem also requires of finding out what is the cycle of innovations, how many innovations keep taking place. And I think in the last five years, the innovations in some of the areas, this is especially anything to do with biotechnology, which is either drugs or with seeds, or anything to do with software has been phenomenal. And those who rise can also fall off, and a lot of people who get dropped off on the wayside. Then who becomes the consumer? Is it the competitor or is it the end consumer? Under the Act, a consumer is one who buys a product or a service or who buys uh, or who hires for a price. Now, look at it in terms of a case which is going on. I don't know how it will go up. There's a company known as Micromax. And Micromax has been fighting against uh, uh, Ericsson because they're using that, uh, that software for Ericsson. And the question they'll naturally say is the royalty is very high. Have they gone to the high court? The commission has to look at it. I have no idea what happens. But is Micromax the end consumer? Well, you say no. But according to the act, he is because he does buy the patent to use it. He's got the license. And therefore, then the question is for economists to look at whose welfare and the larger issues of consumer welfare. And that is where these sort of problems keep coming up. This has been more or less the case in all the cases that have become, come before the commission. There's been no one who's gone up to and said, look, I have this phone with this Ericsson, whatever it is. If now Ericsson doesn't work, something else will come in. But rather, we try to look at it in terms of Micromax and say he's a young economist, and they give the example of China. Let me also tell you that if you look at the latest economists and see who has really gained from innovation in the software, it is India and Malaysia, not China. And the only country that somehow seems to be going, I don't know how, is USA. And I keep wondering why are all the cases against all these innovations come from Europe, because Europe has slagged. Europe has stagnated. Europe is now what India was 30 years ago. 
They don't have anything new. I think Erickson is the only one who's fighting continuously. Am I right? It is this country. Now, if it is this country, and all our brains are there for things which involve innovation, which involve innovativeness, should we be protective? But if you're protective, what kind of protection? What kind of policy? Now, the brains are here. We have to. We are a service industry. We are a service sector. So the regulatory environment then also becomes important. And the regulatory environment is not just the Competition Commission of India, but there's also the regulatory environment of telecom. There's also the regulatory environment that you have of the patents. And according to the patents uh, people whom I met about two, three months ago, and I used to think that earlier all our patents were drugs and chemicals, we are wrong. A lot of patents have now started coming into software. So if we have to keep this system going, and you have to look at it, I think it is very important to identify the consumer with society and the benefits that come to society. Maybe a higher cost to pay, it could be defrayed by the government, by uh, licensing or whatever manner. There again, I'm not too comfortable with this concept that has come up of having compulsory licensing for drugs, because there are other effects that are taking place. With respect to the regulatory framework of patents, we talk a lot about compulsory licensing and about the pharmaceutical industry. But if we actually look at the text of the Indian Patent Act, there are provisions over there which actually talk about arbitrary patent acquisition, which have not been applied in India so far, except I think once in the Kemptura case, which actually involved a, a, a sort of patent acquisition. This was a huge debate in the US with the Florida prepaid case. So in this context, I think with the rise in innovation, while it hasn't been an issue so far, it could become a major issue in the times to come. So if any thoughts on this? Kemtura, let's, uh, let's be clear, Kemtura is not government acquisition of patents. This, I think, has been done only once. I'm forgetting the name of the company. It has something to do with railway tracks and uh, some technology related to laying railway tracks. Now, when you say about government acquisition or compul compulsory license in the same breath, please, uh, please make a distinction. Yeah, so compulsory license is something which has been granted so far three around, one in pharmaceutical recently, and there were two much earlier. Again, with some, uh, there they were some kind of a hooks or uh, I don't know what, to, what they were called, not from that field of technology. So that was, so government marching rights are something which is prevalent in most of the jur jurisdictions. That they, they, if situations permit, then government can acquire a technology. So even in the case where government of India had acquired that technology under section 100 of Patents Act, that was something to do with a railroad technology which was hampering government's own public activity of laying down railway tracks. So that is the only, that's the only case where it has been done. And uh, apart from that, there have been two instances so far when patents have been revoked because of public interest. Both these cases were agrochemical cases where, where, uh, where it, it would have, uh, the government thought that it would be detrimental for the public at large to allow a technology, a technological exclusivity on that area. But apart from that, we haven't seen a revocation by government for public interest as well. There have been one instance of compulsory license so far and one instance of compulsory license for public health needs by the government which is pending. So this is the scenario. But we have seen that the government of India has been quite uh, restrained and quite uh, responsible in dealing with such kind of issues so far. We can find this kind of of behavior all over the world in many areas. We can, this is what we call power laws, and we find them everywhere. But this is also an opportunity for countries that are new because you can, um, you can identify the hub and you can connect yourself to the hub, which makes you maybe a faster way to improve. So I was wondering that maybe you should think about it and, and, and let us uh, erase that separation between north and south and just going to the hub and jump. 
if innovation and intellectual property rights or any others there are some there are some elements that one can one can look at and focus on that can immediately uh, spur economies into an innovation and positive spiral of growth what are those two or three things and and that's where we were looking for is are these hubs the rich hubs are these hubs the uh, you know the where all the infrastructure and in it is uh, perhaps it is the, the, uh, it is about infrastructure because a lot of innovation is also about people and ideas and discussions and uh, which which is uh, which is another reason perhaps why these hubs tend to happen uh, but that that's where we were coming from in terms of if we have to create those environments how do we do that and what is the role of these property rights uh, how large is that role so yes to us the one of the biggest factors is exactly property rights because it gives an incentive to to innovate what is much more worrying is copyrights and uh, not only copyrights there's this is also the question of copyrights in music there's a question of copyrights in publication and of course in a country which has no qualms about piracy this is an issue that becomes very important because you know we we always think of that uh, very very intellectual nerd who's coming up with a, a policy but uh, my friend who designs clothes i mean her brilliance is in that design but will she get a right to that and 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 this also is interesting because when i was looking at some of the agri business and the question of the the the, the seed business if there are no strong rights especially on copyrights there is what is known as misappropriation misappropriation is a bigger worry than uh, is one is a major worry and how does one take care of misappropriation you know you might have a plant uh, uh, breeders variety act and you might have the question of this now take the case of the music and uh, the uh, the case came up I, i couldn't do the order and that was interesting because when there is a music and now under the copyright act in india the film that is made has a film producer but there's a separate group known as a music producer and that's a subcontracting with the music producer now the music producer is just the producer who puts in money for getting all the things together but there's a writer of music it's his creative uh, brilliance you know kaifi azmi or any of these people are totally brilliant and then the person who gives the music to it and then there's the singer now what has happened which is becomes important and this came up which what was known as a concept of a two part tariff you pay an upfront fund uh, for known as a patent because that's the right to the music but every time the music is played or the music is used it is the return that the person who has thought of it in creativity that has to come in and that becomes the uh, the 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 operating charges or the second part of the tariff and why i'm bringing this is these are issues that are going to become more and more important in the car trade for example we didn't have copyrights for say how a hub is done or how a door is shaped but that's still a copyright it is a copyright in the us should we accept it in india or say no they have not applied for a copyright so the regulatory bodies can intervene there's a lot of questions that have to be taken up because we are definitely have to encourage creativity i would just like to know that uh, when an author signs an agreement with the publisher in case the publisher keeps the copyrights with him for how long for how many years or for how many editions he can reprint that book without paying the author anything what is called royalty or whatever it is hmm? is there some number of years a number of edition up to how long he can continue uh, that <laughs> publishing company will keep on and then the publishers will tell you we didn't sell any copies but you see it all over and they can also sell it abroad because they have the rights this has to be questioned i brought the music thing precisely because of this and when one case came up uh, we you know the argument would have to be taken along these lines these are issues that are now coming up i agree with you completely when you assign a copyright 
to a publisher. Unfortunately, we do not have any law as such as of now which have some gives some special powers to the author. When you assign your copyright to a publisher, the transaction is same. See, we were talking about property rights. We are now talking about intellectual property rights. Let's treat it as a property right. When you assign your copyright to a publisher without any further terms and conditions, it is simply like you're selling your property to somebody. Once you have sold your property to somebody, it is the title is with that person of that property. I, I, he may he may do whatever with uh, with that property. I beg to refer. Section fifty seven gives the authors a special right. So in copyright, there are two rights: moral rights and economic rights. Moral rights is always remain, so you cannot tinker with his work. But if I can sell the work as many times as I want. Right? That is a different thing. The moment it is about tinkering, you are talking about doing something else. What we are saying is that the same. If this is the book, I can reprint this n number of times yes. for sixty years from the date of the next year of the death of the author. But uh, as far as the uh, author publisher agreement is governed, because you have to go by that only. The author does not have that power of bargaining generally as a, a, a publisher would have. So we have other laws where we have identified, the, the policy makers have identified that two people are not at the same footing for bargaining and, they, and policy itself has given some special kind of powers and rights to something, somebody that the policy makers thought was at a weaker footing. So maybe going in future, that can be one of the areas to think about if you are think, uh, thinking about rights of author when it enters into a kind of a bargaining or thing uh, negotiation with a publisher. But unfortunately, as of now, there is none. I agree with you, Bhaskar. I think uh, IPRC is the best place. There's already a platform and there are a lot of studies that can be taken up. And these are issues that are very important because it's not that you know ordinary people can get lawyers because even corporate houses in India do not have as many smart lawyers as they have in the uh, the West in the uh, in USA especially to which there is no excuse you have to be equally smart if you want to play the game be smart so similarly with all these publications it would help an organization like yours I'm sure will go ahead and take up to do a lot of work in this area and uh, on this note, I would like to thank Bhaskar and Aarti who introduced me to a lot of new areas debate and all of you who have enlivened it. And I'd like to thank IPRC for the opportunity given to me. Thank you.